Charles G. Boyd is the only prisoner of war from the Vietnam conflict to attain the rank of four-star general. Born in Rockwell City, Iowa in 1938, Boyd entered the U.S. Air Force in 1959 through the Aviation Cadet Program, which allowed him to complete flight and officer training simultaneously prior to completing an undergraduate degree. After graduation from pilot training at Greenville Air Force Base, Mississippi in 1960, Boyd completed several assignments in the F-100 and F-105D. In November 1965, he joined the 421st Tactical Fighter Squadron at Karat Air Base, Thailand. On 22 April 1966, during his 105th combat mission, Boyd was to take out a surface-to-air missile site near Hanoi. But while taking heavy missile and anti-aircraft fire, his F-105D received a direct hit, forcing him to eject behind enemy lines. He was captured and taken to the notorious Hanoi Hilton. Over the next 2,488 days, he was subjected to isolation, interrogation, torture, and the infamous Hanoi March. After seven years in captivity, he was released to a different world on 12 February 1973. Man had walked on the moon, the Super Bowl was created, the Beatles broke up, and Boyd had missed it all. After returning, he excelled in numerous staff assignments and in 1986 was named Vice Commander of 8th Air Force. As a Lieutenant General, Boyd took command of Air University and consequently the Gathering of Eagles program in 1990. In 1992, he was promoted to a fourth star as the Deputy Commander-in-Chief of U.S. European Command. Boyd's career came to a close in 1995 after 36 years of military service. He was awarded the Air Force Cross, the Silver Star with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Bronze Star Medal with V Device and two Oak Leaf Clusters, and the Purple Heart with two Oak Leaf Clusters during his long and distinguished career. A command pilot with more than 4,000 hours in numerous military and civilian aircraft, Boyd continues to fly his beautifully restored T-34 to this day. He lives in Virginia with his wife, Jessica Matthews, and serves as the chairman of the Center for the National Interest, a public policy think tank in Washington, D.C. Air Command and Staff College is proud to honor General Charles G. Boyd as an Eagle. Relax. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, General Boyd. Thank you for joining us. Would you like to make any opening comments, sir? Well, maybe a couple. Um, first of all, I think a tip of the hat to ACSC and this program for selecting, with one exception, some really interesting and deserving uh, eagles this year. I've benefited from getting to know each one of them um, and go away richer than I came. Um, maybe it would be worthwhile to pick up uh, 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 where uh, General Manor left off yesterday um, in his wonderful presentation and uh, uh, but in, in that part in which I think is the absolute pinnacle of his own career as commander of the amazing Sante raid. Um, maybe I could add a little bit of texture to that by giving you uh, something of a perspective of a guy who was at Sante and who unfortunately left there um, in July uh, before the November raid. So I missed the bus that you sent up there for me, sir. <laughs> and I'm sorry I wasn't there. <clears throat> but I can tell you this, um, and there was controversy, and General Manor mentioned it uh, yesterday, there was controversy about the mission and um, the 
reason for doing it and the risk that it involved and the possible bad consequences that might occur. And I know for a fact that uh, when Admiral McCain was briefed on this and in the context of his own son being uh, a prisoner, uh, the idea came up or was expressed or he had it himself, I'm not sure, but uh, if in retaliation then those prisoners not extracted would suffer um, retribution, um, perhaps severe. And so uh, there are other controversies about it, but I can tell you this, that uh, in every respect that I can think of, uh, that raid was successful. It was, it did not cause, it, it panicked, of course, the, the, the Vietnamese and, and uh, um, we knew something big happened in the middle of the night when the world came on fire and missiles were going off and, and sirens and all kinds of AAA guns and what have you. We didn't know what it was, but we knew it was big. And we knew the next day when the, the, the people, the guards and so forth, the staff of the, of the prison in which I was located uh, were completely spooked. And by the end of that day, we were all loaded with band, uh, blindfolds and, and handcuffs and whatever you put onto trucks and moved and found ourselves in the old Wallow prison, the old French prison, which we called affectionately the Hanoi Hilton. So, and by the end of the first day that we were there, we got a little piece of paper pushed through a rat hole into our cell, which came from an adjoining cell in which there were Vietnamese prisoners. And that little scrap of paper, coarse paper like you've never seen before, it had a little stick figure under a canopy of a parachute. It had a little crudely drawn helicopter and below that it said Sante USA OK. So it didn't take a rocket science to figure out what that raid had been about. And of course we were disappointed. We were just those of us who had been to Sante were certainly I think everybody probably disappointed that it hadn't it yielded any POWs, but we were all ebullient that it had been what we were sure a great success. And in the history of such things, I can tell you this, in my, to my knowledge, this, this is the most successful commando raid that I'm aware of. Nothing that I know of was executed as brilliantly as exquisitely in all details as this one. We've seen a very good one recently, um, the raid that went after bin Laden, but this was far more complex than that, much more, many more moving parts. And, uh, and this man who commanded it uh, should be remembered forever. Okay, Amit, it's your nickel. Yes, sir. So taking you back, sir, how did you get into flying and what has flying meant to you? Everything. It started when I was seven, I believe. Um, I don't know what it is. I mean, I, as a little kid, I could see airplanes going over and ooh. <laughs> And on my way, on the way, we would go on Sundays once in a while to my grandmother's house and down in the country road, and there was a little airport along the way, a little grass strip with a Quonset hut and a couple of beat-up airplanes. And uh, there was a Piper Cub 
that a guy used uh, during the week uh, as a crop duster. It had a tank in the front seat and some spray nozzles on it. And then in the weekend, where he'd take that tank out and put a seat in it and he'd give rides. And so we would go by and I would see this and hey, Dad, come here. <laughs> and no, we were always in a hurry, you know. And eventually, uh, he succumbed to my relentless begging and let me go for a ride. I don't know what it cost, two bucks maybe or something small, but <clears throat> a 15 minute ride in a Piper Cub and it, uh, it changed my life. And from that day on, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly and, uh, and I got to do that. I got to do that. <clears throat> I won the, the lottery of life. But that, don't you see, led to uh, things that, as a young fellow, I could not possibly have imagined. It opened doors for me um, that were simply beyond my uh, earlier comprehension. First of all, it took me into an institution that, that was truly a meritocracy, and it gave you, I, I, I didn't have a college degree. Uh, I was. Uh, a kid from very modest uh, means. So I showed up for the aviation cadet program with a AWOL bag and a pair of jeans and a shirt, and that's about it. And, uh, and it let me do what I wanted to do. And, uh, I, I, and that just kept happening <laughs> over the years. I, you know, there are a couple of speed bumps along the way, but for the most part, I just got to do things that I couldn't have imagined, and, and I got to, and then I'd do that, and I'd get to do something else, and I'd get to do something else, and I'd get to do something else, until in the end, uh, well, here I am, uh, flying in the Air Force, uh, picked up the tab for all of that. Yes, sir. Now, sir, back to Vietnam. You spent seven years fighting in a war in a different theater than a lot of your peers. What did that teach you about leadership, about organization that you might not have learned had you progressed in a more normal way? Um, it, it's a different, a little different form of warfare, but it, it is warfare. Um, it's, it's warfare that, um, that has some consequences, it has some dimensions to it that don't occur in other forms of warfare. For, for, I think the, 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 the main thing that happens, certainly my own view, and I think others would, would agree, is that you become powerless in a way that's beyond um, most of our imagination. Uh, of how to become powerless, where you are now in the hands of an enemy that uh, has total control over you. Uh, whether you be tortured, whether you be brutalized in any way, whether you be fed, whether you be killed, I mean, he has total, absolute power. And the loss of that power to find yourself, because most of us, think we're pretty neat, you know, we have, <laughs> we're flying airplanes and, you know, we're uh, full of life and full of uh, ability to express ourselves. And suddenly, all that's gone. So, learning to cope with that without having, without having any power at all, and to still then in some way um, take on and ultimately defeat your enemy. And there's only one way to do that, and that is to resist what he wants you to be. To resist success. And you can do this. You can do it successfully. 
The enemy can make you... He can break you, but he can't keep you broken. Um, he can make you write something that you don't want to write. He can make you say something, maybe, that you don't want to say. But as long as you are willing to come back and take, again, what it is he used to break you the first point, and again, and again, and again, Eventually, he's defeated. He can't break you permanently. And that's the way, the only way I know, to restore your own dignity and your self-worth. In a completely powerless situation. So that's a form of warfare that we don't find in any other aspect that I know of. What does it tell me about leadership? I can, I can give you examples of, of men who, um, who brought leadership to a level of, of uh, excellence. It seems to me that is uh, almost unknown the rest of my existence. Robbie Reisner, a name that almost everyone knows. Jim Stockdale. Reisner was a, a particularly interesting fellow, it seemed to me. <clears throat> um, uh, 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 first of all, a, a, a superb aviator. A, a guy who was gifted greatly. But a modest man, and a, and a man that was not particularly uh, well educated. He was certainly wasn't a profound thinker. He was not. Uh, uh, he was not going to become the president of the United States or uh, a great scientist or anything. He was a fighter pilot and, and a hell of a good one. But he also had character. He was a moral man, and he had character, and he had, most of all, he had a sense of responsibility. And when he became a prisoner um, in the early days, those who were already there were dispersed, and of course, in, and, and had no sense of organization. What Reisner did was to take responsibility. He was the senior ranking guy, and to take and, and to be able to then, uh, through clandestine means of communication and what have you, put together a structure uh, of an organization and and rules and, and, and guidelines on behavior and so forth, and. Uh, and in the process of doing that, of course, he was uh, caught often uh, communicating in a way and, 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 and tortured, beaten, brutalized, but it never stopped him. He just kept coming back. And uh, I, I can make that story last all day, but uh, the, the point is that what he did, and he presented himself as a man who would behave in a way at a level of standard that was a model for all of the rest of us. And I don't know that any of us ever quite achieved his level, but he made us better, better men, I think, than we would otherwise have been. I put him up there, by the way, with Ernest Shackleton and uh, uh, Chamberlain, Larry Chamberlain, Joshua Chamberlain, who saved the Union on the second day. Yes, sir. Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Now, in terms of conflict, generally, you're primarily identified with Vietnam, but you also served through Grenada. Allied force, Desert Storm. Um, 
You've also made more than a dozen trips to Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan during OIF and OEF. Can you point to any similarities uh, between successes or maybe differences which contributed to coming up short of expectations in those more recent conflicts? Well, I didn't participate in any of those uh, other than that I did a little bit of help in some of the planning on, on a couple. But, um, but I've been an observer, um, uh, paying attention to uh, uh, the conflicts that our nation gets into. In the case of Iraq, I made uh, eight trips to Iraq at the invitation of commanders there, different commanders. Um, four times to Afghanistan, a couple times to Pakistan. Um, and had access uh, to, to a, a, a lot that uh, I think most observers and probably most Codels didn't have. Um, there's a, and maybe this is just as I'm getting old and, uh, and cranky, but um, there's a, it seems to me, a depressing um, uh, frequency of uh, getting involved in conflicts in which we don't understand the nature of the conflict that we enter and politically and how best to execute uh, that conflict. Um, I, I, I don't mean to be uh, cruel in, 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 in my assessment, but I think it is true that um, um, we don't benefit very much from uh, a thorough knowledge of history. Um, particularly uh, among the political class, um, Kissinger's biographer, uh, Neil Ferguson, is, says in the first volume, um, something I can't quote exactly, but it is rare to find a public official who has any meaningful understanding of history. And therefore, we make, repeatedly make mistakes that a little bit more knowledge would have prevented. And maybe this is, is, is where the folks sitting out here in the audience might give some thought. Uh, in the main, uh, you all know more about conflict than your political masters. Uh, you've spent a lifetime, and not all of you, and. Uh, but, um, but some of you, the better ones of you, will have studied a great deal uh, about uh, the history of warfare and conflict and political conflict and so forth. And you will find yourself, as you become senior, in a position where it is your task not just to know how to execute with the capabilities that you possess, but also to offer your counsel, your advice to your political masters on the things that can go wrong and, and the things that they need to decide on and shape and provide guidance on to avoid failure or diminished consequences of diminished opportunities. It's your, it's your task, your, your, your responsibility. And we as military officers, I would submit to you, don't do that very well for the most part. We don't do that very well. H.R. McMasters wrote a, a wonderful book on the failure of, of the military leadership uh, in the Vietnam conflict. Now, we had a massively ignorant um, president and his uh, uh, people surrounding him, but it, the, the people that 
could help him from the military weren't doing so, weren't doing so well. When I came to War College, as a matter of fact, uh, as a student in 1976, and uh, a parade of uh, speakers came through the auditorium, and for the most part, uh, talking about the failure of policy and the failure of the political uh, class in that war. And finally, I was, uh, Young Lieutenant Colonel, I had about all that I could stand, and I stood up and said to one four star, if this was such a bankrupt policy, why did you execute it? Why didn't you leave? Why didn't you say, I cannot be a part of something like this? Well, the Commandant looked around to see who this smart aleck was back there in the and it, and the embarrassed, the, the, the four star was embarrassed. But the fact is, um, he and his brethren had not done that. And I believe should have. Uh, Colin Paul had, uh, uh, he had the stature and he certainly had the knowledge uh, um, and, and was resistant to moving into the Iraq War. And um, his president could not have tolerated uh, him leaving office, and resistant against uh, uh, moving into a war that he clearly believed was unwise. You have a power, uh, and, and, and Americans are not very good. My American military men have not very, been very good in our history in executing that power. General, many of us uh, here at ACSC are headed off to staff jobs next. You've served in staffs at multiple levels. Uh, what are some of your leadership memories from serving on different staffs? Um, staff works a lot different than operations. <laughs> and you all know that, but maybe you don't know exactly what you're getting into. Um, it, there are two things, and, 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 and everything else is, is less important. When you arrive there at that staff, having never been there before, and uh, if you have any kind of an opportunity to decide, to choose, an area of expertise within the framework of wherever you're assigned, do so. If not, somebody's going to give you one. And, and, and take that area of what you don't have any expertise yet, maybe, but you need to develop expertise in that area as quickly and as deeply and as thoroughly as possible, if whatever it is, that's your territory. That becomes your thing. And spend 12, 14, 16 hours a day getting to know everything you can about that. Because when the general wants the paper, you don't have time to learn it then. What you give him, um, is what you've got in your head. And the more you've got in your head, the more you can give him, the more quality uh, topic matter, uh, the better off you're going to be and the better off the organization is going to be. And the second thing I would, I would encourage you to do, because generally speaking, military officers don't write very well. That's just a fact. I've read thousands and thousands and thousands of staff papers in my senior years, and not very many of them are quality papers. Learn how to write if you don't know how to write. <clears throat> Learn how to write succinctly, logically, efficiently. Get a coherent paragraph together. <laughs> I, I, 
this is my own bias, but I, I at one time knew, and I've long since, and it's long ago, and it may have changed, but at the Air Force Academy, we had, I don't remember how many, lots and lots and lots of kids that scored 800 on the math side of the SATs, and we hadn't had one entering cadet that had scored 800 on the verbal side. Not one. And yet we taught four more semesters of math. They knew more math when they got there than 98% of them are going to use in the rest of their life. And we gave them eight more, four more semesters, I think it was at that time, of mathematics. We gave them two semesters, one of literature and one of composition, and that's it. And they were going to use the English language every day of their life. And the degree to which they might succeed in life was largely going to be on the basis of how well they could express themselves, how persuasive they could be. They could have the greatest ideas in the world, and if they can't express them, either in written form or verbal form, they're probably not going to get that idea accepted and accomplished. So, spend some time. You're going to have to do it on your own now. Spend some time. Probably advice that some of us could have used about 10 months ago, sir, but. Uh, <laughs> now, General, you flew with Carl Richter in Vietnam and have mentioned him as someone who epitomizes what you look for in an officer. Would you talk a little bit about that, sir? Now, do you all see that statue out there? Um, Carl Richter was, uh, uh, I suppose all the military guys know, but maybe for my friends here in the front rows, uh, you might not know. Carl uh, was a, a, a young academy graduate, I think class of 64, went through pilot training, did well, got into the F-105 straight away. Uh, when I got into the F-105, by the way, you had to have flown a Century Series fighter of some kind before you got in that airplane. Uh, in this case, uh, Carl got to go straight to the F-105 from uh, UPT. <clears throat> when he arrived, he was a fresh-faced young guy. Um, he flew his first combat mission on my wing. Uh, but he, you know, he, he, he was just one of those guys that you just knew had the right stuff. He had that bearing, he had that presence and the eagerness, and, and he clearly loved to fly. Well, shortly after that, uh, I went on a long sabbatical and, and lost track of, uh, of Carl, but I did pick up from time to time uh, from new POWs that Carl had, uh, had flourished in a way that, uh, that I had expected maybe beyond what I had expected. He tore the hell out of everything from the Bent High River to the China border. He flew 100 missions at a time when uh, the odds of getting to 100 were not very good, and then volunteered to fly another 100. And when he was getting close to the second 100, went in for a third. Well, the grown-ups in Saigon said, "No, son, that's uh, you've done way more than your fair share. Your fair share, and uh, denied the third tour." Well, Carl just kept flying and stopped counting them, and, uh, and eventually, of course, the odds ran out, and, and he was killed. So fast forward now. Uh, I'm the commander of the university, and uh, the, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce and the mayor came out to see me one day, and they said, uh, we'd like to do something for Maxwell. And uh, they had, uh, the, the Air Force had retired the SR-71 uh, not long before that. And they said, we would like to, to, uh, to get an SR-71 and, and have it out here and mount it on a pedestal and make a presentation from the citizens. <clears throat> and so I thought about that for a little bit, and I said, I don't want one. 
So we got statues of airplanes all over this base. And for one thing, they're hard to take care of. If you don't take care of them, the whole base looks terrible. You got to paint them every two or three years, and you got to mow the grass. <laughs> so, uh, if I were going to put up any statue, it'd be to a man. We don't have a statue of a man anywhere out there. All we are, is that all we're about is machines. So they had their nose out of joint a little bit, and they went away. And, and I thought about that more and more. And, and then I called uh, the mayor, and I said, "How about getting the?" heavy hitters of the community together, I want to talk to them. And, uh, and he did. And uh, probably 20 or so. And, uh, and I told him the story of Carl Richter. And I, I made that story last about 20 minutes. And, uh, and I told him what I would like to do if I could. I'd like to put a statue of this young man as an inspirational model for the young folks from ACSC and squadron officer school to walk past every day for the next 100 years. But I couldn't do that because I, I couldn't spend appropriated money for that. It's against the law. I couldn't even ask for that kind of assistance. But I just thought I'd tell you folks what I'd do if I could. <laughs> the mayor got up, he had tears running down his face. And he said, well, by God, I'm not restricted by law. Get your checkbooks out. <laughs> and I knew, of course, I'd done my homework. I knew about what it would cost to do such a thing. And they overshot my requirement by 70%. We picked the best, uh, uh, to my mind, the best sculptor in America, Glenna Goodacre. We had a little phony kind of competition, but uh, <laughs> I knew who I wanted. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to tell this, I shouldn't probably, but. At first, we went out to eight artists, as I recall, and, and, and asked them to compete in a, in a competition for this project. And Glenna was one of them. And, uh, and so I guess my aide was, was collecting the, the names and keeping track of all this. And, 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 uh, and Glenna said to him, um, I don't do competitions. And so he came back and told me that. And I said, well, it's probably just as well. She wouldn't be able to understand the nature of a warrior anyway. My aide went back and told her that. And she said, will you tell that son of a bitch? That <laughs> And she came down to see me, and I knew that's the one I wanted to do it. And, and, and so we made sure that the competition ended right. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll tell you one other little ending. Then we'll get to more important stuff. But uh, I wrote, wrote into her contract that I had final approval authority. on. So when she got this thing done in clay and before we cast it, that I had to approve it. And so when she got it to that point, um, she called me up and said, come down and see, you know, it's ready. And so I did. And there it stood, and, you know, nine feet tall. And, and uh, I looked over and looked it over and looked. And finally I said, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good, except his mouth's not quite right. And she said, well, let's fix it. Just get on the ladder. So we got on the ladder. Well, it's one thing to say it's not right. It's another thing to say what to do to make it right. And so she'd say, what do you want me to do? And I, well, I didn't know what I wanted. I just make it right. Well, and, and she'd move her thumb around because the clay was still soft. And finally, she got frustrated and said, look, that's it. I, I'm, I'm quitting. That's, he's right. 
So she climbed down off the ladder. So I climbed down off the ladder and I said, do you have a good camera? She said, yeah. And I said, well, go get it. She had a Hasselblad two and a quarter format camera. I brought it out and I said, I want you to take a picture just of his head, a really high quality picture of his head. She said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm going to send it to his mother. Well, she did. And I sent it to his mother and said, what do you think? And she said, she looked at it for a while, and she said, it's pretty good, but his mouth's not quite right. <laughs> okay, more serious stuff. <laughs> Carl Richter, by the way, is, 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 um, he's as good a role model as you're going to find of the warrior breed, and that's what we put out there. We put that on there. And, 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 and she asked me one other thing. She said, um, what do you want him to say, As before she ever started on this project, what do you want him to say? <clears throat> and I said, do you know anything about the Bible? She said, no. And I said, well, go look up Isaiah 6, 8. That's what I want him to say. You already know what that means. <laughs> Here am I, who, sh who shall go for us? Here am I, send me. Well, sir, I've got another half dozen questions that I'd love to ask you, but How uh, we doing we're up time? against lunch, and uh, I don't think I'd make it out of here if we went through another half dozen questions. So I'll ask you. One more quick one. When, how much time we got? We got time? OK. How much time? Tell me. All right, sir. You continue to fly to this day. What was it like the first time you got back in the cockpit after being shot down? The first airplane I got in after I shot down was, was very, I had a friend who was uh, in corporate flying and, and uh, had a citation jet. And uh, so my first flight was in that. I was nervous. You know, you want to get, you get bucked off the horse. You want to get back on right away. Well, it would have been a long time. And I pulled out on the runway and that thing, and the eyes on the left. See, of course, I had this guy on the right, but, but that matter, you know, because uh, you want to do it. You don't want to screw it up. <laughs> you want to do it yourself. And I remember my hands were shaking. Uh, but as soon as we started, uh, I released the brakes and we started moving down that runway. Um, it started to feel right to me. And as I lifted that airplane off, I was flying it again. Never flown that airplane before. And I had a yoke and never flown airplane. The yoke didn't matter. I, I had a hold of that airplane. And the feeling came rushing back in um, that I'd had before. And, and I still have. 78 years old, and I still have that feeling, that rush, that marriage. Dawn uh, Seymour yesterday with beautiful words told us about images, the sun coming through the clouds in, in language that's comparable to Beryl Markham. And that's all there too. But for me, it's a, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the marriage, the union of machine, man and machine, that that integration, that feeling that this is a part of my body, and I can defy gravity. I can move it in the three dimensions. This gives me a physical and emotional pleasure that almost nothing else does. Okay, go ahead. What do you got? One more question? Last one, sir. Do you have any final thoughts for the ACSC class of 2016? You follow a profession that uh, is unique in our culture. Um, no, other, no other profession asks you to 
sign an unlimited liability contract for up to and including your life. No other profession does that, not medicine, not law, not the church, not education, nothing. That gives you a special stature, it seems to me, that you are unique. <clears throat> you, are, you have a purity to you for that reason that is beyond any other profession. You are, you provide a service. When I, back in the 70s when the country was still in getting over its spasm of uh, what it had gone through in the war, people would ask me what my profession was, what do you do? And I would say, I'm a social worker. Really? What kind of social work do you do? And I said, I'm in the military. And they would look at me like I was goofy or something, and I would say, the number one social service that any nation provides is provides for the security of their citizenry. And that's what I do. And that's what you do. Don't waste it. Don't waste the stature that you have by getting into petty political things and exposing yourself to the same level of activity that we see very often in our political process. Stay above it. Stay pure. Do we have time to run a little quick film? Absolutely, General. I want to tell you one last little story. Um, this is a trailer from a movie we're making to tell a story about the guys that came home from Vietnam as POWs and, and what the Air Force did with them. 